All right, hi guys. So this is the third and final video for the chapter on the senses. Last time we talked about the anatomy of the ear and we ended um, talking about the structure of the cochlea. So now we're gonna talk about how the cochlea converts sound waves into action potentials. All right, so in the last video we talked about how uh, we have here our stapes is connected to the oval window, and that oval window is actually connected to this scala vestibuli. So we have our three kind of tubes in the cochlea. We have the scala vestibuli here. We have the cochlear duct, also sometimes called the scala media. And then we have the scala tympani here on the bottom. So the round, or sorry, the oval window right here is connected to the scala vestibuli. So when this stapes, right, vibrates because of a sound wave that caused vibration in the tympanic membrane, it is going to create waves in this fluid in that scala vestibuli. Remember that fluid is called perilymph. So it's going to create waves in that perilymph, right, and these waves are going to travel through the scala, uh, scala vestibuli, they can travel around the end here where the scala vestibuli connects to the scala tympani. That is called the helicotrema. All right. And then they can travel through the scala uh, tympani here on the bottom. All right. If the sound waves travel all the way through there, um, they will reach a structure here called the round window. All right, so the round window is at the end of the scala tympani, and it just functions to dampen sound waves uh, so they don't bounce backwards and go through the scala tympani again. So the function of this round window is to dampen sound waves. And it sits at the very end of the kind of pathway of those sound waves. All right, so as the uh, sound waves kind of move through this fluid, what they're gonna do, and you can kind of see that happening here, is they're going to press on this inner tube, right, that cochlear duct. And so they press on that, causing it to bend, right, and create little waves in and of itself. And so if you remember, within that cochlear duct, we have our organ of corti, which contains our receptor cells. All right, so that was here. Um, so we have our little hair cells here. They're sitting on top of this basilar membrane, right? So that basilar membrane would be here, uh, sitting just on top of the scala tympani. And then we have a tectorial membrane up here. Okay, so if we bend that cochlear duct like this, that is gonna cause this basilar membrane to bend. And so then that bending of the basilar membrane is going to move these little hair cells. And remember, if we zoom in, their little tiny hairs are embedded in this tectorial membrane. All right, so those little hairs, as these cells are, you know, kind of moving back and forth depending on the sound wave, all right, they're going to be kind of tugged and pulled in different directions because they're essentially glued. They're kind of stuck into this tectorial membrane. So, what actually creates the action potential from all of this, the, all of these waves that are happening, uh, if we look at one of our hair cells, right? So this is a hair cell. Okay. And so these are kind of those little hairs we were seeing on the cell. They do have a special name. They're called stereocilia. Um, you don't really have to need, know that for your exam. All right, but on this picture, we're looking at, this is our tectorial membrane. All right, this would be that basilar membrane. Okay, uh, and so you can see this basilar membrane as it moves because a wave has come through, right? That is going to kind of shift that basilar membrane and that is gonna pull on these little hair cells, right? These little hairs. So it's gonna be pulled and what that actually does is there are these little tiny ion channels here in these hairs, all right? And so they have almost like a little trap door that's kind of covering them, 
right, with a little uh, thread connecting them to the next hair. So if these hair cells all bend, right, this little trap door is gonna get pulled up and now ions can enter, all right, these would be positively charged ions, can enter that hair cell, all right, and make it more positive and you know from our neuron, uh, our nervous system chapter, we make it more positive. We produce an action potential, all right? So the positive charges uh, are gonna travel down, all right, towards the bottom of the cell and it cause neurotransmitter to be released. Okay, and then that will produce an action potential in this nerve here, right, which will travel uh, through that vestibulocochlear nerve out of the ear. Okay, so to recap, right, kind of what you need to know about this process uh, specifically is that sound waves cause movement of the stapes. That movement is transferred through the oval window to the perilymph in the scala vestibuli uh, and the scala tympani. All right, those waves of the perilymph are gonna move that basilar membrane the physical movement of that basilar membrane is going to pull open ion channels on the hair cells, allowing that hair cell to produce an action potential. Okay? That's kind of the, the summary of that. All right? And so the, <clears throat> the basilar membrane is very organized. So the proximal portion of the basilar membrane, so the region closer here to that um, oval window is going to detect higher frequencies of sound, all right? So the proximal basilar membrane detects high frequency uh, versus the more distal parts that are closer to that helica trema uh, detect low frequency, all right? So that's all just determined by, um, you know, uh, what, what frequency of sound is needed to actually move the basilar membrane in that region, all right? So um, high frequencies here, lower frequencies here. So the frequency detected would decrease as you move through that basilar membrane. Okay. Um, and so another interesting thing about hearing is that hearing the same sound over and over and over at the same frequency for a long extended period of time uh, can actually cause deafness at that frequency. You can kind of exhaust and wear out those little hair cells and they don't um, respond anymore. And so actually an example of this is my dad. Uh, he's a retired dentist and using that dental drill all day long um, at that very specific high frequency has caused him to lose hearing uh, to higher frequencies. So he, he doesn't hear very well um, for higher pitched sounds. All right, so overusing at a certain frequency can cause hearing loss at that frequency. Okay, and so the action potential that's produced in response to that sound is sent through the vestibulocochlear nerve. From there, it's gonna travel to the inferior colliculi and then that, because remember that um, processes information about sound reflexes, right? Turning towards sounds to localize where they're coming from. From there, it will be sent through the thalamus, our sensory relay station, and then to the temporal lobe where it can be kind of interpreted what that sound was uh, and that sort of thing. All right. So then... Um, lastly, with sound and hearing itself, uh, we'll talk about two types of deafness. So you can have conduction deafness, all right? And so conduction deafness results from the sound not even being able to reach the point of the cochlea, all right? So this could be as simple as um, somebody wearing earplugs, right? So if you put plugs in your ears, you're essentially, you're stopping your ability to hear because you're causing conduction deafness. So those sound waves can't reach your tympanic membrane to cause it to vibrate. Uh, this could also come from damage to the um, tympanic membrane itself. So if you rupture your eardrum or something like that, that could cause conduction deafness. 
Also, as we mentioned with our otitis media, you can have collagen that can build up uh, within the middle ear, causing the ossicles not to be able to move. That would cause conduction deafness as well. All right, and then there is sensory neural deafness. And so this more um, is associated with the actual action potential being sent to the brain. And so this would involve problem with the part of your inner ear, uh, maybe the hair cells, or uh, communication between those hair cells and the vestibulocochlear nerve, or even the brain, um, and something going on there. Okay, so conduction deafness versus sensory neural deafness. Okay, the ear also plays a very important role in balance and equilibrium. So let's talk about what it does for balance and equilibrium. All right, so physiology of balance. So this does also occur, um, these functions occur in the inner ear as well. So if we look uh, kind of, let's go back up and look at a bigger picture. All right, here we are. This. This is a good picture. So we're looking at the inner ear here, okay? So we were just talking about the cochlea here, which is involved in hearing, all right? And so now we're gonna focus on this side, which is gonna be really important for balance and equilibrium. So on this side, we have two main structures. The first one here is called the vestibule, all right? And then over here, we have our semicircular canals, both involved in balance and equilibrium. They just detect slightly different aspects of balance and equilibrium. All right, so let's talk about those two. All right, so the vestibule first. All right, so the vestibule is made up of uh, two different parts, right? So we have the saccule and the utricle, and together they're gonna detect head position. So they just detect um, movement of your head right in different directions. So if you tilt your head, it's kind of what this picture is showing here, right? You tilt your head forward or backwards or uh, one side to the other. That movement is going to be detected by the vestibule. Okay. And so the way it works uh, is again, we're going to see little hair cells at work. All right. They're just going to function a little differently. So we have these little hair cells with their stereocilia. Those are just the hairs on the hair cells. But in this case, if we zoom into this picture, you can see that inside of this vestibule, right, our little hair cells with their little hairs here, right, are embedded in this gel-like kind of slab, right? It's like a big uh, thick block of gel. So those hair cells are kind of stuck in that block of gel, okay? And so that, gel, right, has these little crystals that sit on top that are called otoliths, okay? And so that is inside of the vestibule. And so the way they detect head movement is if you say like this picture, you tilt your head forward, right, those little crystals that are kind of stuck in that gel uh, are gonna shift their weight and they're gonna pull that gel forward and that will bend these hair cells. And as we talked about just a minute ago, bending those hairs on the hair cells causes an action potential, all right? So you can see going from here where your head is straight up to here where your head is forward, we've created a bunch of action potentials very quickly, all right? And so if maybe you tilt your head back all right, this way, those little otoliths, the little crystals are gonna shift their weight the other direction. That is gonna move these little hairs in the opposite direction, and that will cause fewer action potentials to be sent. And so your brain can tell the difference between this, right? Lots of action potentials means your head must be tilted forward, fewer means it must be tilted back, and it can kind of take all that information and make sense of it, all right? So that is for the vestibule. So the vestibule detects head position, right? Is it tilted forward? Is it tilted back to the left or to the right? That's its job. And then we have those semicircular canals. So the semicircular canals are gonna detect rotational movement of the head, okay? So think of rotational movement as being uh, kind of this scenario, right? Where you have like an ice skater or a gymnast or someone who is twirling around, right, in circles. That's rotational movement. 
and that's detected by the semicircular canals. Okay, and so the semicircular canals are made up of three tubes, right? You can see them here, these three tubes, one, two, and three, and they're all kind of sitting in different planes, all right? So we have this one here that's kind of straight up and down, this one here that's kind of at an angle, and this one here that's kind of more at a downward angle. So we have upward and a downward angle. So those can detect rotation kind of at different angles. Okay, so they're in different planes. So at the base of those tubes, we have a structure that is called the criste ampullaris. So that would be what we're looking at here. All right, so this would be like one of those tubes of that semicircular canal right here, you know, this leaving. And then at the base of it here, we have this criste ampullaris. In that criste ampullaris, again, we have some little hair cells with little hairs or little stereocilia embedded in this kind of gel structure like this. All right, and so what happens is when you rotate that fluid, you can kind of see it depicted here, all right? So the fluid inside of these tubes, um, called endolymph, similar to what we had in the cochlea, all right, that fluid will start to kind of whoosh through that criste ampullaris uh, with the movement of that rotation, right? So it creates kind of this current moving through here. That current is going to bend those little hair cells, and we know bending hair cells is going to cause an action potential, all right? So then your brain can interpret, depending on which way those little hair cells are bent, all right? That'll tell it which way you're rotating and as to which of, you know, these criste ampullaris for which of those tubules uh, is bent, that can give it more information. All right, so semicircular canals detect rotational movement. Um, the, vest the vestibule detects head position. All right, so that is the balance and equilibrium function um, of the inner ear. All right, so that wraps up the ear. So now let's move on and talk about olfaction. All right, olfaction is gonna be smell. So let's talk about smell very briefly. All right, so smells are detected by chemoreceptors. That just means that they are activated by uh, different chemical signals. Okay, and those chemical signals have to be in the air, right? So you have to inhale them in the air uh, and then they will enter the nasal cavity where they're gonna encounter um, the nerves, right, the olfactory nerve uh, dendrites within that uh, nasal cavity. So if we look <clears throat> at kind of the arrangement of this uh, structure, you can see what we have here is we have our optic, or sorry, our olfactory nerve, right, coming from the brain, and it ends in this olfactory bulb, which you learned about with the brain. That olfactory bulb sits directly on top of the um, cribriform plate, all right? So remember, the cribriform plate is on the uh, ethmoid bone, all right? And so that's what this is. This is the cribriform plate. If you remember kind of hopefully from lab, you saw with that cribriform plate, it has a bunch of like little holes in it. It looks kind of like Swiss cheese. That's because it has these holes for these olfactory nerves to travel through. And so they are going to contain nerves from these bipolar, that's just remember our shape of our cell. So we have our neuron here, and it has some dendrites going out here, axons going this way. So that's a bipolar shaped cell. All right, so we have our bipolar neuron, and it's stuck in this structure called um, olfactory epithelium, right? That olfactory epithelium just simply contains uh, these, um, these bipolar neurons and their dendrites here, which are actually gonna detect those chemical signals that you're inhaling, okay? So they're gonna encounter different odorants, different smells in the air you breathe in, that's gonna cause an action potential. That action potential will be sent up, right, into that olfactory bulb, where it can then be sent out 
through that olfactory nerve to the brain. Okay, again, those odorants, those smells, the chemicals have to be in gas form. Okay, and so you should be familiar with the pathway that information takes. We'll have our receptors. Those chemoreceptors are going to be on those bipolar neurons. That's here. All right. Those neurons are going to be activated. They send their axons through the cribriform plate. Remember, that is part of the ethmoid bone. All right. Then they're going to synapse. You can see those little synapses right here with neurons in the olfactory bulb. All right, so uh, here we have our synapses in the olfactory bulb. That is gonna be sent out through the olfactory tracts, right? And those are gonna go to the temporal uh, and frontal lobes where smell information is gonna be processed. Uh, and remember, interesting thing about smell, it doesn't actually travel through the thalamus, right, that sensory re relay station, or the brain. It just goes directly to the area of cortex where it's going to be interpreted. Okay? So that's smell. So now let's just talk briefly about taste. Okay? And so taste, obviously, is going to happen in the mouth. All right? So let's look at the tongue. Okay, so if we're looking at the tongue here, you can see it's covered in these kind of large structures, right? We would typically just call those taste buds, but of course, this being anatomy and physiology, they have a special kind of scientific name. Um, they are called lingual papillae. So just remember that a papillae is a projection of some sort. It's sometimes referred to as like a nipple-like projection, all right? And so all of these little structures are papillae because they're on the tongue. They're called lingual papillae. Um, so not all lingual papillae, all right? There's four different types, right? And not all of them have taste buds. So there's three of the four types that are gonna contain taste buds, all right? Um, the others uh, don't, but in general, they still are really important because uh, lingual papillae, in addition to functioning in taste, they also help provide friction when you're chewing up food and when you're eating, okay? So helping to <clears throat> move that food around your mouth um, so you can chew it up, okay? So we have our lingual papillae. Many of them contain taste buds. Um, and they, those taste buds are going to contain, again, chemoreceptors. So these are going to detect chemicals. Um, as opposed to the olfactory, where these chemicals had to be in gas form, for taste, chemicals have to be dissolved. Um, particularly, they're usually going to be dissolved in saliva. Okay, so those chemicals have to be dissolved uh, in a fluid, which is why if you have a very dry mouth, right? You may not taste things as well because you don't have that saliva helping to uh, dissolve <clears throat> those different chemicals so that they can be detected by these chemoreceptors. All right, so there are six types of tastes that can be detected by the tongue. All right, so we have, um, you probably are familiar with sweet, All right? You can detect salty tastes, uh, you can detect sour tastes. Uh, you can detect bitter tastes. Then a couple you may not have heard before. Um, you can detect something that's called umami. And uh, it is thought, and this one is a little bit in question, um, and I like uh, when we're teaching this class to actually talk about this because Usually half the class is kind of on either side. They're on opposite sides of each other. But uh, a lot of people describe that there is a special taste for water, right? That you have a special kind of ability to detect water or it tastes a certain way, right? And it doesn't fit into any of these other categories. So it's given its own category, okay? So we'll put that with a question mark, right? Because a lot of people kind of debate that. Um, so... With these different tastes, we can kind of think about what um, some of those chemicals might be, right? So sweet, obviously this would be, you know, certain carbs, glucose, for example, it tastes very sweet, sucrose, that sort of thing. 
salty. These would be um, ions like sodium chloride. Sour things would be from um, hydrogen ions, right? So more acidic things are going to tend to taste sour. That's from the hydrogen ions. Uh, interesting thing about umami, so if you've never heard that term, umami just refers to kind of a, like a savory flavor. Uh, it's oftentimes associated with meat, right? So this is savory. And actually is associated with a very specific chemical, right? And that's MSG, monosodium glutamate. So monosodium glutamate activates the chemoreceptors that make something taste savory. All right, good. So then just the pathway for that information. So from the tongue, this information can be carried by three different cranial nerves that you learned. Uh, it can be carried by the facial nerve. All right, so that's cranial nerve number seven. It can be carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve. All right, so that's number nine. And the vagus nerve which is number 10, all right? So it's gonna be carried by those three nerves uh, to the brain, all right? And another important thing to point out about taste is that it is very closely linked to smell. So you know if you've had a cold or something and your nose is stuffed up um, that you can't taste things that well anymore either, right? So smell and taste are linked that link would be more in the brain and how taste is interpreted. Um, and so a lot of times people that have damage to like the cribriform plate, right, in the brain that has damaged olfactory nerves, um, they will have a very difficult time uh, tasting things, okay? So there is a very strong link between taste and smell. All right, so that is it for the chapter on the senses. All right, and that's our last chapter this semester. So um, good luck preparing for your exam four. Study very hard, all right? And then you can start focusing on your final exam.